Welcome to lesson 1, GVM architecture. Java threads are mapped to native OS threads. The operating system schedules and dispatches these threads, assigning them to an available CPU. After the Java thread is prepared, the native thread is created, which then invokes the run method. When the Java thread terminates, the native one decides whether the GVM has to be terminated. Per thread components, program counter, which is the address of the current instruction. Frame, each frame contains return values, operand stacks, storing arguments return values related to virtual machine instructions, local variables array, storing parameters of methods, locally defined variables and the object these, and references to runtime constant pool for current method. Runtime data structure similar to a symbol table containing numeric and string literals, class references, field references, and method references. Stack. Last in first out structure containing a frame for each thread method being executed. Methods themselves are stored inside the structure too. The Java virtual machine generally does arithmetic on its operand stack. Components which are shared across all threads. It memory stores class instances and array at runtime. Frames only store pointers at data contained in this area. Objects can be removed from this area only by the garbage collector. Method area storage of per class information such as class loader references, runtime constant pool, field data, method data, and method code. As all threads can access the previous areas, all accesses have to be thread safe. The JVM internally describes classes, interfaces and objects using references to symbolic information in the constant pool table. Entries have the following format. This is your structure, so both of them are unsigned, one bytes long, right? So the tag is going to tell you which objects or method you are dealing with and the info is an array of characteristics or attribute or whatever you want to call it. So example are the field info, the method info, the attribute info and so on. And that's the format of the class file that the JVM will have to read and load into memory. All these items are unpadded and there is no space in between them. Let's have a look at the first one. Magic has to be this one, which defines the class file, and that's an unsigned 4 bytes long item. Then we have a minor and major version, which define the version of the bytecode. So that means that define whether or not your JVM will be able to read this bytecode and understand it, and both of them will have to be unsigned 2 bytes long. And then we have this array over here, which contains a list of object strings which are referred to within this structure and its substructures. This is the index. And this access flags is a mask of flags which tells you whether this is an interface or whether this is a class or whether this is private or public, etc. This class and superclass are index of this constant pool array and they are pointing out this class and its superclass. This array over here contains all super interfaces. This array over here, see field info type, contains all fields and is going to give you the name of each field and whether or not it's private or public or protected and so on. Finally, we have a list and description of all methods and additional attributes, like for example, whether or not this class or interface has been deprecated. Internally, the JVM doesn't navigate through methods and properties exactly as you do. Internally, classes, instances, and local variables are represented by class descriptor. Now, if you want to indicate that this is the class thread, this is what you need to write. No dot and this L over here. Now this is an array of double, three-dimensional. This 
is an array of thread. See? Likewise, methods can be described this way. The method add is accepting a generic object and is returning an integer. The method myPrint doesn't require any parameter and it's not returning anything. Let's find out how the class loader turns your code into actual objects. Now, during the loading phase, it finds and reads class files, loading them into a byte array. Minor and major version are checked, then objects are created from the bytecode. During the linking phase, it verifies the classes and interface obey the Java semantic requirements, so that these checks are not necessary at runtime. It allocates memory for static storage and other data structures, such as method tables. It verifies symbolic references by trying loading reference classes and interfaces. That's an optional step which might be deferred. Now we need to start initializing things, so it executes the class or interface initialization method. Several class loaders may be used. Bootstrap, which only loads classes found in the boot class path, which is the trusted one. The extension one, which loads extension APIs such as the security ones. The system class loader, which is the one that usually loads your classes. And the user-defined one, which generally is used by applications such as Tomcat or application servers and so on. And that's the very last thing that we need to cover just before we start playing around with the code in the next lesson. Now, the exception table stores per exception handle information, such as the program counter offset for handle code, start and ending point, and constant pool index for the exception class being called. When an exception occurs, the JVM looks for a matching handle. If none is found, the current method is ended pop in the stack frame. Next, the exception is rethrown in the calling method and so on. If no ender is found, the thread is terminated, which might cause the JVM itself to terminate if this is the main thread. Thank you very much for watching this one and don't miss next class because we're gonna finally analyze in some actual bytecode. Thank you.